Hello students, wanted to come back and talk with you just a bit about the concepts of objective beauty versus subjective beauty. I've had a question or two about it. We were writing about it in our group discussions this past week, offering examples. And I wanted to be sure that as we move into our final op-ed essay that we have a better understanding of what we're talking about here. When we use the phrase subjective beauty, what is being described is the limited standard by which we express our own preferences or taste. From a postmodern perspective, and Dr. Gruthrus is going to great pains in his work, Truth Decay, to point this out, there is no belief that there is anything transcendent in any work of art created by a human being, or if postmoderns would accept the concept of God, certainly by, by divine creation. That beauty is indeed limited to the eye, the preference, the taste of the beholder. Now, I don't want you to get tripped up in what Ruthrus is doing. Ruthrus is not agreeing with that postmodern thought. Gruthrus is offering many examples in arguing against that postmodern thought. In fact, there is a section in his chapter on objective beauty in which he offers 10 or 12 reasons why the approach of postmodern thought is not correct and that God does not limit himself to just beauty being in the eye of the beholder, but that there is indeed something transcendent. There is meaning. There is a message, there is truth, and there is goodness in the created work of God. And he's given us the capacity to be creators like he is a creator. And therefore, we have the capacity not only to create that which demonstrates truth or good, but that we with our minds have been gifted to discern that objective beauty, that truth, or that good. Thomas Aquinas is an 11th century bishop in the Catholic Church, and he described objective beauty this way. He said, beauty is that which is pleasing to the eye when seen. Well, that sounds a lot like subjective beauty, doesn't it? It does. And so we don't want to argue that there is no such thing as subjective beauty. We see certain things, and they are appealing to us. We have preferences for the forms of art, film, music, literature, sculpture, paintings, this kind of thing. Uh, so there is indeed that component. But what we're arguing here, so that we understand that postmodernism has missed the mark in their declaration that there is no such thing as transcendence in the created. Uh, we're looking here at the standards by which beauty are measured. Aquinas went on to talk about three standards of objective beauty. He said, first of all, that beauty begins in the mind. It is seen with the mind before it's seen with the eye or heard with the ear in the case of music. So the mind, the intellect, is involved in this process of assessing something for its transcendent truth or reality, its transcendent goodness or reality, and therefore it's beautiful, or it's seen as objectively so. And he used three characteristics or standards we didn't really get into a lot of this in our readings, but I'm sharing it with you now so it helps make a little more sense, hopefully. First of all, he described objective beauty, that which is seen is pleasing when it is seen, is it possesses integrity. Now, what he means by integrity is the totality of it. It's complete. It's whole. It's not destroyed, it's not diminished, it's not damaged in some way. What's interesting in Aquinas' way of thinking about integrity is that a rose that is in full petal bloom, there is nothing diminished about it, 
There's no damage to it. Uh, there's no defect in it. That possesses integrity. But over time, what happens is that rose begins to fade. The petals begin to wilt. The color begins to drain away. Things that were supple now become hard and brittle. It's dying, right? And so therefore, it doesn't possess the integrity that it once did. It still might be pleasing in the aesthetic sense. In other words, we might look at a fading rose and think it has a certain beauty and a message all its own. But when Aquinas talks about integrity, he talks about it being, being whole with no defect. Second, he talked about proportion. It has to be measured by proportion. That is, the mind likes order or stability of likeness. It is the same on the inside as it is the outside. One of the teachings of Scripture about God's view of humanity is from Samuel in the selection of David as the next king of Israel. He was so different than his brothers in size and, and in nature. But Samuel pointed out that man looks on the outer appearance, but God looks on the heart. So what Aquinas was doing was connecting the inner beauty, the inner integrity, with the outer beauty, the character. When we've been reading, for example, in Proverbs 31 about the virtuous or industrious woman, not only does she have inner qualities, she has outer qualities, right? Uh, somebody who goes to the market to select a cantaloupe or a watermelon or, or something like that, what do they do? They thump it. Well, what are they doing? Well, it's their way of finding, is it fully ripe? Is it as good on the inside as it is on the outside, right? So Aquinas talked about integrity. He talked about proportion. And then third, he talked about clarity. In other words, the mind likes intelligibility. When you look at it, not only do you know what it is, you are immediately drawn to it, right? It's the mind telling the eye or the mind telling the ear, take notice. This is something that possesses integrity. It possesses proportion or harmony is another word for, for proportion, in, inner and outer uh, proportion and, and uh, coherence. Uh, it is clear and it draws your attention. And so whether it's a beautiful sunset or it's uh, a Mona Lisa, whether it's uh, Beethoven's classic work or it's a piece of poetry that captures the heart, the mind, or the imagination, it has clarity. It, it, is, it is not only intelligible, it, it attracts, it draws the senses in. It captures the imagination or the attention. That's really what McAllister was doing in the video that we viewed, the extended video, when he used the diamond as an example, and he talked about the four C's. Do you remember what those were? He talked about clarity, right? He talked about carrot. He talked about cut. And he talked about color, remember? those four. Um, what we're doing is looking at something beyond just, well, I like it or I don't. I can take it or I leave it. It has no transcendent meaning or purpose. We're looking at it from the standpoint of it having the capacity to possess transcendence, something beyond itself, something that's God in nature right? We certainly see that in God's creation, and he's given us the ability uh, in our own creative ways uh, to produce that as well. Now, there is much of human creativity in the arts that does not possess objective beauty, and one of the things that Ruthris was doing was working to help us understand that when postmodern thought diminishes what the standards are for beauty, truth, goodness. We're going to miss, in fact, 
we can actually uh, profane the objective truth or beauty that's found, goodness or beauty, that's found in a particular item of art or created work that we are accessing with our minds and then assessing with our, with our senses. And so there can be some created work that we fallen human beings make uh, or produce that does not possess that kind of beauty. It wasn't going for it, didn't believe in it, didn't expect it to exist. We hear it, we see it in cinematic art, in music at times, sometimes in sculptors, artwork, painting. Um, it has this nature that is more profane. And what I mean by that is that it deteriorates in its quality. It diminishes the reverent possibilities that could exist for truth and goodness to be present in whatever we're looking at or whatever we're creating. That's humanity's fault. That's on us that we've diminished it or we've distorted or corrupted it. God still has his standards of objective beauty that he uses to assess, and he wants us to do the same. I hope this is being helpful to you, particularly when we move into Op-Ed 3. I want you to be able to distinguish objective beauty from subjective beauty, not merely in the eye of the beholder. There's a greater standard that begins in the mind, not just the emotions, not just our preferences, but it's also true that beauty uh, captures us and that we do assess things for their beauty or their lack thereof. And so it's really a combination of the two, isn't it? What Gruthrus was doing and what we're working to do is to make sure that we don't buy into the postmodern philosophy that there is no such thing as objective beauty, just as the postmodern thought is that there's no such thing as absolute truth. Both are false. And what we're doing in Op-Ed 3 is arguing back. We're replying opposite the editorial where someone has argued there's no, there's no objective transcendent meaning in any of this created work, certainly by humanity and most definitely by God. No, we're arguing the opposite, that it does exist. So with this in mind, you're going to select an example of something that does possess objective beauty. Let's go back and pick up on Aquinas' three standards of integrity, proportion, or harmony, and clarity. Let's go back and pick up the four C's that McAllister told us about. Because you'll recall what he did there was to take the four C's and apply them to the character and the work of God and why God is beautiful, why Christ is beautiful, and why the work of salvation that they produced is beautiful. Not just their created uh, universe or world, but what they're doing in recreating humanity. So once again, I'm hoping this is helpful to you, and I'm nearby if you need any further clarification. I look forward to reading your work.